As I started driving home from the base where I was stationed in New Mexico, at the first stop I made to try to get something to eat, I was refused service at the restaurant. They allowed me to fill my tank with gasoline. And as I went into the restaurant and sat down, still in my Air Force uniform, had just been discharged and coming home, a big guy walked up behind me and he grabbed me on my shoulder and said, we don't serve, and he used the N-words in here. And he said, if you know what's good for you, you will get out of here and get out of this city right away. All the way from El Paso, Texas, back to Jacksonville, Florida, everywhere I tried to stop along the way to eat, they refused to serve me. I remember driving uh, down US 90, and when I crossed the line into Mississippi, there was a large billboard on the side of the road, and it used the N-words and said, you know, Ends and Jews don't let the sun set on you in this county. And when I saw that sign, I um, again felt a little bit concerned for my safety because I was traveling alone. I couldn't use restrooms anywhere, so I had to use the woods. Couldn't eat, and I decided as I was making that drive that as soon as I got home, I was going to do everything in my power to try to change those conditions because I didn't want anyone else to experience what I had gone through. We started sit-ins in August of 1960. The sit-in wave, if you will, started in February of that year. The sit-in demonstrations, like many other movements during the Civil Rights Movement, many other demonstrations during the Civil Rights Movement, was about human dignity and respect. At Woolworth, it was a lunch counter, but the lunch counter was restricted for white only. And part of the demonstration was to have some of the African American young people uh, at the urging of the NAACP to come down and sit at the lunch counter and kind of ask to be served, knowing that that was a, a violation. And understand that. Woolworths invited us into this store and all the stores downtown that had a lunch counter they invited black shoppers into their stores to spend their money at all of the counters except that heretofore white lunch counter that lunch counter that had that invisible sign that said for whites only so when we sat at that lunch counter that lunch counter was a visible vestige of segregation and it gave us the opportunity to dramatize how we felt about racism in Jacksonville and this country. On August 27, 1960, the NAACP Youth Council was preparing for a sit-in demonstration at Woolworth's lunch counter. We saw a pickup truck with a group of men who had started unloading what looked like baseball bats and axe handles. Whites in Confederate uniforms on the Duval Street side of Hemant Park gave out free axe handles to anyone who wanted it with a sign up that said free axe handles. And um, after we sat in at Grant's that day, we were attacked by 200 whites with axe handles and baseball bats. As soon as we were seated at the counter at Woolworth, we were spotted. And these guys came chasing into the store, swinging their baseball bats and their axe handles, and they were trying to hit every one they could see every person of color in sight, whether we were demonstrating or whether they were people on the street. When it all started, that building over there was, was then a cafeteria, was Morrison Cafeteria. Um, I was confronted by um, a number of white men, and they all had axe handles. And of course, they started to taunt me and threaten me. And they started beating these folk with axe handles. And my group was able to get out through the side door. And we noticed that the only avenue for escape was, was either directly across the street uh, to the Lawrence Street, uh, not the Lawrence Street, but the Snyder Memorial Church. And there was a police officer standing watching the whole. Uh, situation and and they were kind of threatening me with the axe handles, kind of taunting me with it. It was kind of hitting me, but it wasn't, you know, swinging to hit me to hurt me, you know, just in kind of a menacing nuisance way. Went, ran over to the uh, 
police officer for uh, some refuge, and uh, I can remember his words just like he said them yesterday. He said, you better get out of here before they kill you. During the attack, there was no help for the youth council until the boomerang showed up. Somehow the boomerangs heard that the uh, youth council was being attacked downtown and they rushed in from the place where they normally uh, gather in the mornings, which was a place called Bubba's Coffee Shop on Ashley Street. But they rushed in and started beating the people who were attacking the demonstrators. The police were around and the police did absolutely nothing to attack, to protect us while we were in the store. But as soon as the boomerangs started beating the people with the axe handles, then of course the police rushed in to start, start trying to stop the violence. Um, I don't think they did a very good job of stopping it because the violence went on for a long time, long after we were gone from downtown. The, the unique thing about that whole situation is that that officer wouldn't help me. And, and, uh, um, and I thought he should have. And, um, but um, I always wanted to be a police officer, too. And um, I ended up being sheriff of this county. And any white person who tried to defend or support a black person during that attack, whites would also attack them, them too. There was no police protection during that time. Police did not come until well after everything was over in terms of the, the, the violent conflict downtown. The press blacked out all news about Axe Handle Saturday, Channel 4, Channel 12, the Times Union. So there was nothing on the television airwaves. There was nothing in the newspaper about Axe Handle Saturday. Uh, only the black press covered anything about Axe Handle Saturday. So uh, a lot of information was not available at that time. One of the young men who was beaten that day, uh, whose iconic uh, picture was, was featured in Life magazine, was named Charlie B. Griffin. He was not a part of the youth council. He was not uh, demonstrating. He was downtown shopping. So then he was attacked just because he was black and he was downtown. And uh, that picture of Charlie Griffin in Life magazine, even though it's a black and white picture, shows his blood splattered on the front of his shirt in that, uh, that infamous picture. And as passive as a sit-in demonstration appears to be today, it was a very violent confrontation to the system, even though we did not sit in with any weapons of any kind. The fact that we were black and we were sitting in at a white lunch counter was a violent confrontation in the minds of many white folk because we were confronting um, that racism and we were in a place that they considered their comfort level. We, we had no intentions of violence with violence. We had every intention of showing that all we were trying to do was be citizens. And the whole area around the Woolworth store had erupted into some of the worst violence I had ever seen. Uh, but the problem with today and the problem in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, just like the problem with passing a civil rights bill or voting rights act. Racism is always that 800 pound gorilla in the room. It is something that is there and the more we decide not to acknowledge it, the greater its presence will be. You know, I don't think we've seen enough change and I don't think the change came soon enough, but yes, we are not the city we were back in 1960. We still have a long way to go. Instead of it being something that stopped me, uh, it, it motivated me. And, uh, and sometimes, who knows, that yesterday might have made me better. Because we did not sit in at the lunch counters just to eat a sandwich and a drink of beverage. We sat in because it was about human dignity and respect.